Good morning, dear, dear students, morning classes. This is Dr. Amjad Latif, your drama instructor. And today we are to discuss together um, the second part of scene five of the first act of William Shakespeare's best tragedy, Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark. To but refresh your memories and minds, I told you before that this scene can be subdivided into three subsections. Now, section one, which we discussed yesterday, uh, it deals with the night watch. Then um, we had Horatio, Hamlet, and Marcellus waiting for the appearance of the ghost on the castle battlements of Elsino. The second part, which is supposedly the lecture of today, in which we will have the first full meeting between Hamlet and the ghost of his father, the meeting that we long waited for from the beginning of, of the play up to this moment in the actions and the course of the drama. Then the third part or the third section in which we will see that Hamlet appears to us as a chained man, he's now pretending madness. And then he will ask also Horatio and Marcellus to keep what they have seen tonight as a top secret and not to reveal it or tell it to anybody on the planet. Then moving to our second part of today, which is something very important and significant and pivotal indeed, which is the first full meeting between Hamlet and the spirit of his father in which Simply speaking, to but give a summary to you of this meeting, then the ghost will appear to Hamlet, and we all know that he has a very important message to be delivered. Then, to only the meant person to hear this message, who is of course discovered to be and found out to be Hamlet, then that ghost now will tell Hamlet that he is not naturally dead, but he was murdered at the hands of his uh, brother Claudius, the uncle of Hamlet. And then even with the help of his ex-wife, the Queen Gertrude. Then after that, the ghost, the spirit of Hamlet's father, will ask him to give him swears and vows to get his revenge and vengeance so that he will let his soul to rest in peace and to move from purgatory to heaven. Then to dig some deeper, in the events of the second part of this scene, which is the most important, in fact, in the whole act one, then you will see that the, the ghost of Hamlet's father from its first appearance, really even when it is a ghost, its appearance is something royal, is something authoritative, is something like the really the, and actually the, the appearance of a king. Then, Displaying dignity, authority, gentleness, and sadness from its part, the ghost. Now the ghost of Hamlet's father identifies himself to Hamlet by saying, I am thy father's spirit. So really, even from the early beginning now, you will see that the ghost now identifies himself to Hamlet, his son, as the spirit of his father. The reason behind this is definitely because Hamlet doesn't know up to this moment if that ghost and spirit, if it is evil or a good spirit, if it is really the symbolic, the, sim, the symbolic, let us say, uh, uh, incarnation of of the, his father or, or something else, a devil maybe, or an evil spirit or the like. So the first thing to be done really cleverly by Shakespeare, the first thing to be done from the part of the ghost is to identify him in this very clever way to let hamlet rest in peace and to let hamlet let us say uh, having no doubts that this is an evil spirit but it is the spirit of his father then the apparition the spirit the ghost of hamlet's father tells hamlet that it is condemned to walk the night it cannot rest until the sins on its soul are burned away the ghost cannot tell Hamlet what purgatory is like or how the spirit suffers in fire. Mortal, I mean the human beings, could not understand or bear to hear the horrors that wait beyond death for those who die with the stain of sin on their souls. 
So really we have here a very significant question. Then our query here, our question here is, we all know that this king, Hamlet's father, was a good king. He was really good for the wife. He was really for the family. He was really for the kingdom. He was really for everybody then at the, at, at the time of his living. So surprisingly now, we hear him tell his son that he was living in, in purgatory, not in heaven, not in paradise. Okay. So purgatory is, is a place in hell in which people's who, people who have sins, who have also good deeds, okay, they will be burned then for a while in hell and purgatory, and then they will be sent back to heaven to enjoy the blessings of paradise, okay? So really, we want to discover out this fact, to figure out this, this idea, this notion, what makes that good king to live in purgatory? Yes, it is not Elysium, it is not hell for the, the, for the damned souls, which is Elysium. No, it is in between. Like we say in, in Arabic in the Holy Quran, we say Al-A'raf, okay? So it's now in between, okay? So then uh, we all expected that such a person, such king, such a good king, should go directly to paradise, should go directly to heaven, not even to be sent even for one moment to that purgatory. And we never expected that he had since to be burnt down then before enjoying the blessings of paradise. So please keep in mind, uh, students, please, this question and answer this question to me in your Google Classroom today. Then, Hamlet now, a virtually speechless Hamlet, wants to hear what the ghost has come to tell him. He focuses all his attention on the spirit's words. Now, Hamlet, you will see, is really paying so much attention to the words that are uttered, every word, every single word that is uttered by the ghost of his father. He just wants to know what is this very crucial message that is to be delivered to him. So when he heard this sentence, now revenge, I mean the ghost told Hamlet, revenge is foul and most unnatural murder. Up to now, nobody expects, anticipates or knows that the, 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 the king, the late king Hamlet's father was murdered or killed. Or killed. Everybody knows that there was a story which says that there was a snake that stings him while he was uh, having a nap in the afternoon as his usual practice of everyday life, okay? So now this sentence really comes like, like a thunder on the, on the ears of Hamlet. Now, those words revenge here and murder, they are pronounced in a very special way, okay? By, by the ghost. And they are also, what is more significant, they are heard, they are hearken by Hamlet as whips, really, as echoing words with great force, even as if he heard them in this way, revenge and murder, with a very, let us say, stress on the re sound of both words, okay? So that is why these words, murder and revenge, are stressed so much, stressed with a very high intonation, rising intonation, in fact. And they resound against Hamlet's ears like physical blows. They are blowing him. They are just like whips on his ears, on his mind, on his brain even. Hamlet now finally understands what the ghost is saying. But that understanding comes at a terrible price, really a terrible price. Because yes, Hamlet was just waiting to hear this message to be delivered to him. Now, when the message is delivered, now Hamlet understand that this message is delivered to him at a very terrible price, which is the price of revenge, the price of revenging not someone who is, let us say, uh, far away from Hamlet, not, not to revenge some natural or some, let us say, ordinary human being, but it is to revenge from his uncle. It is to revenge from even as he thinks, from his wife, although we'll discover later on that the ghost will tell him never to harm and to hurt uh, his mother even by uh, one word, okay? Then, at this moment, at the surprise of Hamlet and the audience as well, at the shock we all received because no one expected that such a king is uh, murdered and killed, and by whom? By, by his own brother and 
for the sake of usurping the throne of Denmark and even with the help of his ex-wife, really something so shocking and surprising that we hear now said by the ghost of Hamlet's father. So the spirit now tells the story of his death to Hamlet. He revealed everything to him. He was not stung. This is the real story of the murder of, of, of the late king, Hamlet's father. He was not stung by a serpent as everyone had been led to believe. Instead, he was poisoned by Claudius. The ghost's long narrative describes the extent of Claudius's villainy and deceptiveness. The ghost dwells on the effect of the poison poured in his ear and on the various rewards his brother gained from his death. Claudius killed Hamlet's father and married his mother, and Hamlet must now seek revenge for his father's shame and murder. So it is a double revenge, a revenge for the shame of the hasty, very quick marriage to his mother after a very short period of time after the death of the late great king Hamlet's father, and then also a revenge for the murdering of his father at the hands of his uncle Claudius. Then Hamlet has no trouble at, at this moment, at this specific moment. Now Hamlet has no trouble. He has no problem whatsoever to be mentioned in promising the ghost that he will carry out his wishes. Remember, then you students, please remember that Hamlet is passionate and impulsive. That, that is why he is now impulsive. He acts as a passionate uh, person. He is now acting in with, with the drive of his feelings, okay, with the drive of his passions and emotions. That is why he will promise the ghost. He will swear to, to the ghost directly to, to gain and to get and to do that act of revenge and vengeance from Claudius. Then, but he is also, we shall never forget, please, that Hamlet is also doubtful, okay? So he is an intellectual. He's a student in Wittenberg University. So he is not some, let us say, common man. He is a man of thought. He is a man of knowledge. He is an intellectual man who is really relying so much on his mind and thoughts. That is why we will expect that there will be a war a battle inside of him, an internal conflict inside the mind and heart of Hamlet of to do the revenge or not to do, of to be or not to be. Then, and in the light of day, when the morning will come, the next morning directly, revenge will not come easily to him. He will not act this act, this, let us say, action of revenge so easily as was expected by the ghost. Then, Finally now, in this scene, the ghost reveals the most horrifying aspect of his death. Then in another lapse into the Catholic tradition of that time of the Elizabethan period and era, the ghost cries that he was sent to his afterlife without a chance to confess and do penance, penance for his sins. So he was sent to purgatory without even, he is sent out of this life and to purgatory without having even the chance to confess his sins. This is a Catholic tradition that when a person was able to uh, confess his sins before his death, he will send directly to paradise and to heaven. But if he, she doesn't have that chance, then that person will be sent to Elysium if his sins are more than the good deed done, deeds done by him, or if he is now a mixture, he has a mixture of sins and let us say good deeds, then he will send to purgatory if and only if he or she had not the chance in their lifetime to confess their sins, okay? So this is the matter now that happened to the king. He was murdered once at a sudden, so he had no chance to confess his sins. That is why now we understand he is sent to purgatory and then he is to be burned for a while for the sins that he committed and was not able to confess them. And then after that, he will be sent to paradise and heaven. So then we understand that he told his uh, son Hamlet that he cries that he was sent to his afterlife without a chance to confess and to do this penance for the sins that he committed in his lifetime. So he mentioned it in this way while he said, I was sent out of this life with all my imperfections on my head. So all the sins he committed, he was not able to confess. 
he was not giving the chance to confess his uh, sins and his, as he called them, imperfections to why he is now going and be sent to purgatory because he left this life with all the imperfections on his head, with all the sins that stained his heart and mind. Then, according to the Catholic belief, without absolution, what is this absolution? It is called by the Catholics the last rites, okay? The last right that is given to the person to confess the sin so that he can go to paradise. Then, without having this chance of absolution, of confession, of what is called by the Catholics the last rites, now the soul of a person is marked with sin and must stay in purgatory, that place which is between Elysium and paradise, which is between hell and heaven, then that soul should stay in purgatory until the sins are removed and cleansed all by the fire that is the holy fire of God, as William Butler Yeats called it, the holy fire of God that is cleansing and purifying and purgating the souls of the sinners so that they can then be sent to a paradise. Then with the coming of dawn, once again, as in the first meeting, that short meeting between Hamlet and his father, the ghost of his father before, then whenever there is a dawn, you know that according to the Elizabethan beliefs, uh, ghosts and spirits, uh, supernatural elements, they have uh, limitations. So one of the limitations of spirits and ghosts is that they should only appear, they have the chance only to appear after the coming of midnight, and then they should depart and they should leave the location in which they are roaming and moving now and dwelling in uh, just before the coming of dawn. So now the dawn is so near, so close, so that the spirit must depart, must leave now. His last words, surprisingly enough, the last word he uttered to Hamlet, to his son, are, remember me, as you see, remember me so really we are again shocked and surprised we all know that hamlet was the only character in this play from the early beginning of the play up to this scene up to the end of act one nobody nobody ever has um, even a mention of the king nobody remembered him the only person and character in the play who was really remembering the memory of his father the memory of the late king is hamlet and only hamlet so Hearing these words, remember me, from the part of the ghost of his father, teared Hamlet, really. They were tearing at Hamlet's already wounded soul. Now his soul was already wounded. And then hearing these words from the part of the ghost, really now they torn him apart. They won him apart. Now, um, up to this point, as we know, Hamlet has been criticized by everybody in the play for remembering his father and being overly depressed because of his father's death. Hamlet now believes that he is the only one who does remember. So that's why he is surprised. Now he is the only one really who is remembering the memory of his late father, of his late king. Then that is why we will see, we will hear him crying at the empty air. Now he'll start to cry with really a high voice, okay, loud voice, telling the ghost, remember thee, as you see here. Remember thee, remember you, I thou poor ghost, I you poor ghost, no, yeah, you poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe, remember thee? Now, this is a rhetorical question first, okay, to understand the figures of speech in this extract, which is said by Hamlet, the eloquent, really, uh, man and character. First, you will see that this is a rhetorical question, a question that is not seeking an answer because there is no answer to this question. The answer is none already. Remember the, now we know already that Hamlet remembers the ghost. He remembers the memory. He keeps fresh the memory of his late father and late king. And then if you look here at this sentence, then while memory holds a seat, now um, Hamlet plays uh, cleverly on the words in which then he uses a personification okay to convince the ghost that he's really remembering him and to express his surprise and shock to the ghost of asking him to do this act of remembering him then he told him in a personification that as if memory now you know personification is giving 
um, characteristics, features of uh, human beings, of animate things to something which is inanimate. The inanimate here uh, thing is memory, which is now personified as a human being, which is holding, which is having, uh, taking a seat now, as if memory is sitting in the mind of Hamlet, as if uh, the memory now of uh, Hamlet's father is sitting so deep in the deepest core of his heart. Then that is why Hamlet is really surprised and he asks this uh, rhetorical question to the ghost. Then Hamlet then um, really let's just ask this question. Do you think that Hamlet's father think really that Hamlet could forget him? Does he not realize the extent of Hamlet's love and loyalty? Now, please have a look and please give it a second thought. Look at these questions and please try to answer them as well in the Google Classroom. Okay, now note, I shall, give you, I shall give you a note that Hamlet calls his head a distracted globe, which is again, even in the midst, now this is Shakespeare's cleverness and wit, even in the midst of this despair, of this distress, of this depression from the part of Hamlet, even in the middle of hearing by the audience and by us all in the middle of hearing this terrible story of murder even in the middle of that Shakespeare will use his wit now to use to make Hamlet to use pun to pun with the words to play with the words uh, to start punning and pun you all know is when a person or a character or writer uses uh, two or more words with the same uh, spelling or pronunciation but with different meanings now, the word that we are punning with here, Hamlet is punning with the word globe, which is, of course, the first meaning means earth, okay, means this whole world, and the second meaning is the globe theater of Shakespeare himself. So, Shakespeare is cleverly here, punning with the words to remind his audience that they are sitting now at this moment at his own theater, which is named the globe theater. So, really, a uh, good tip from Shakespeare in making a very useful advertisement to his globe in the middle of very important, significant events, okay? Then, now, Hamlet's uh, second soliloquy is now will start here from this place, from this location in the play and in the scene five of act one. Now, you remember we had the first soliloquy of Hamlet in which it was a soliloquy of depression, of sadness, of melancholy, only in which he was wishing to be dead, in which he embodied and symbolized all the characteristic features of a depressed person, that depressed person who hates his own life, that uh, depressed person who thinks that he has no power to change anything and everything in the world, and even he has no, let us say, control over even his own uh, life and decisions. Now, this second soliloquy starting from here is a totally different soliloquy because now the real story of the murder of his father is revealed to him. That is why now the second soliloquy of Hamlet is filled with anger. It is no more with depression and sadness, but it is filled with anger, excitement, and resolution. Anger for the murder of, of, for hearing the murder story of his father at the hands of his uncle with the help of his mother. Then excitement, a surprise, a, a passion, really a great passion of revenge. Then also an excitement for, and a surprise for what he is hearing from the part of the ghost according to the murder story. And also it is a soliloquy that is filled with resolution. Now, we, for the first time in this play, we will see that Hamlet is a fully resolute man, is a fully resolute character. He will give the vows and the swears to the ghost of his father directly without even giving it a second thought. So Hamlet now is having resolution to have vengeance and to have this revenge act against Claudius for the murder of his father. Hamlet now knows that the hatred he has felt towards his ankle from the early beginning of the play has not been unfair or misplaced. Hamlet has no trouble promising his father that this one thing, which is of course revenge, the most important and focal and pivotal theme of our play, will now occupy him solely. So from this, uh, let us say, 
um, from this part of the play up to the end of it, we will see that Hamlet's mind, Hamlet's heart will only be occupied with only one thing, with one aim, with one goal, with one objective in life, which is to having this revenge for the murder of his father. Then he calls on the entire universe to be, to be a witness to his vow. He is now calling everybody, calling everybody to be a witness. And even he is now addressing the universe again in a personification. He is speaking, addressing, uh, uh, sorry, in, in an apostrophe as a figure of a speech in which we address somebody who is dead or who is absent from the scene. So Hamlet now is making use of this figure of a speech, which is apostrophe, to address uh, the universe, which is something abstract, to be a, to act as a witness, okay? as an eyewitness, as a witness to all the uh, vows and the swears that Hamlet is giving now to his father to take revenge from his uncle Claudius. So then he condemns Claud no, look when Hamlet moves from passion to to uh, to his thoughtful character and personality is really something else. So now after this passion of the vows and swears given to the father, now he condemns Claudius for having placed the burden of revenge upon him. Really, it's a, it's a hard burden. It's a weightful burden. It's something so difficult. So now he started to curse uh, that uncle Claudius, that king Claudius now for um, making Hamlet the one who is now to take revenge. Now, of course, because of the killing of his father. So the only one, who is having the right to get this revenge and vengeance, according to the Elizabethan beliefs, is Hamlet, the only one son, uh, boy son, of course, of the late killed murdered king. Okay, so now he started to curse that Claudius for uh, murdering the, the father of Hamlet and then in turn to make Hamlet responsible and the only responsible person to have his revenge back from Claudius. Then we will see that he refers to his mother as a pernicious woman, as an evil woman, as a, a woman who is not trustworthy, a woman who is surprisingly enough accepted to replace the great late king and husband with someone who is, according to Hamlet's words, who is a villain, a smiling damned villain, as he called him here, okay? So really it is something never understandable Hamlet cannot understand and comprehend such a substitution that is the one that is made by his mother in, uh, let us say, substituting a very uh, dignified, authoritative man, a very great king with someone who is a smiling and damn cursed um, villain. So uh, then to end this part and to have an end to our lecture of today, which is the second part, of uh, scene five of act one. Now we see, uh, we all see Hamlet now bids farewell. He says goodbye to his father's ghost. And then he swears, he give him the vows that his murder will not go unpunished. Okay, so this is the end of our lecture for today. Uh, please don't forget as always to stay home in this Corona times time so please stay home and stay safe from all the throws and the bad consequences of this COVID-19 um, pandemic and please I wish you a good uh, health and a pleasant uh, staying home with your family members and loved ones. See you with the third part of scene five.